why my I noticed that my uh, anyways anyway hey hey guys hi um you guys know who I am but and this doesn't work does it no. oh it does Actually? it does okay all right it works it works it works praise uh praise praise Yahweh he comes through always at the right moment I was just reading about that today um literally I was sharing off Austin so we're still going through word and name studies. Uh, last week we went over Yahweh, um, the holy, the, I mean, how God disclosed himself, his personal name, Yahweh. Um, and today we're going over his central characteristic, which is chesed. I know it sounds like chesed, but it's with a K-H, so chesed, the little guttural. You know, it's, it's a fun one, chesed. And it means love. Uh, and I, I subtitled it, Covenant Love for His Covenant People. Yeah. Uh, it's, the co- covenant is a, a major idea. We'll be getting, that, that'll, be another, uh, that, that'll be another study um, in the coming weeks. But let's get into scripture reading. Now, last week I had a stand, but I'll just simply read it to you guys. We have quite a bit of scripture to go through. So we're back in Exodus 34.6. And I'll just begin reading. You guys could join along, you guys can. If not, then just let me speak. Um, then Yahweh passed in front of him and called out, Yahweh, Yahweh God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. And then we're going to go to Lamentations. Um... Lamentations, uh, 3, 22 to uh, 23. Let me get it up real quick. Uh, All right. The loving kindness of Yahweh indeed never cease, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And in Psalms 136, the whole psalm, I, I was like, I'll just do part of it. And he's like, no, I, I really want them to get what David was getting at. And so I'll be reading it for you guys right now. Psalms 136. Give thanks to Yahweh, for he is good, for his loving kindness endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods, for his loving kindness endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his loving kindness endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders, for his loving kindness endures forever. To him who made the heavens with skill, for his loving kindness endures forever. To him who spread out the earth above the waters, for his loving kindness endures forever. To him who made the great lights, for his loving kindness endures forever. The sun to rule by day, for his loving kindness endures forever. The moon and stars to rule by night, for his loving kindness endures forever. To him who struck the Egyptians through their firstborn, for his loving kindness endures forever. Then brought Israel out from their midst, for his loving kindness endures forever. With a strong hand and an outstretched arm, for his loving kindness endures forever. To him who divided the Red Sea in two, for his loving kindness endures forever, and made Israel pass through the midst of it, for his loving kindness endures forever. To him who led his people through the wilderness, for his loving kindness endures forever. To him who struck great kings, for his loving kindness endures forever, and killed mighty kings, for his loving kindness endures forever. Bless you. Shion, the king of the Amorites, for his loving kindness endures forever. And Og, the king of Bashan, for his loving kindness endures forever. And gave their land as an inheritance, for his love and kindness endures forever. Even an inheritance to Israel, his servant, for his loving kindness endures forever. Who remembered us and our low estate, for his loving kindness endures forever, and has snatched us, from our adversaries, for his loving kindness endures forever. Who gives food to
to all flesh, for his loving kindness endures forever. Give thanks to the God of heaven, for his loving kindness endures forever. Loving kindness is pretty important, huh? So, why are words important? Like I said last week, and I'll repeat it, every word and name study and every theological study we have, we're always going to go over the importance, just to remind us. In the ancient Near East, right? Not modern day America. Uh, words actually have meaning, right? They actually have, like, huge meaning. If you ever study, um, you know, ancient Hebrew or ancient Greek, uh, um, specifically Hebrew for our context, words are in uh, masculine or feminine. Words will have different meanings depending on the context. Uh, words will have a breadth of other words to show how deep it is in context. I know for some of us who are Spanish speakers, there's a lot of, uh, I'm not a Spanish speaker, but I have, Sp I have family who speaks Spanish. And when they try to communicate to me, they're like, oh, well, there's just not an accurate uh, translation for this. So the best I can do is this. And you ha they have to tell a story sometimes. So you can actually explain what they're trying to get to you. Uh, and oftentimes we're reading something in English and we're not getting the full story, which brings me to the next point. It's in a narrative context. Um, ancient Hebrew is, is, is VSO, verb, subject, object. It's read right to left. So it just completely messes up our paradigm on how to read. And a lot of times the verb, the verb enhances a subject and, you know, we're reading in English and we're like, huh, I think that's a subject. You read it in Hebrew or if you read it in Greek when you guys get, when, when we get to that, you're like, oh, that's uh, not the subject at all. Actually, the, the subject is this. Um, it's very interesting when you read it that way. Uh, but that's why there's a huge context to the words. There's a huge context to the narrative. And the narrative context, especially with Chesed and his love, is it is either Yahweh's or Israel's actions. It's always in the context. It's always in the context of a greater story. Again, um, the Bible is not a list of do's and don'ts. There, there is that. There are the Ten Commandments. There are There is a Shema. There is a whole bunch of things we're, we're supposed to do, we're supposed to not do, but it's more important than that. It's narrative. It's story. It's a story being woven, and those words have meaning. Chesed. Oh, sorry. Whoa, that they cut off. Um, is there any way we can, um, uh, all right, this is cut off anyways. Um, all right. Oh, there it is. Um, so a lovely problem. I think you guys are already knowing that we're talking about love and I had more stuff, but it just didn't transfer over. So love, it is, um, a bewildering term and overused. And, and I'm going to be, um, I'm, I'm going to be like a beating on a, on a dead horse. I think many of us know that love isn't well used in our current society, right? Um, and one week you can hear me say, oh, I, I just love my cinnamon roll. And you're like, I love my mom. And you hear me say, oh, I, I really love music. I, I, oh, I hate this. And then even with hate, even that word has lost its meaning. Not even love. So many of our words in our modern generation are just overused, oversung, uh, misconstrued. It's in a haze of lack of understanding. Um, so I was like reading. <laughs> I was like, well, oh, all right. So what's the issue of love? Um, one of the points I had I didn't put up there is from uh, an article from Psychology Today. One of the, a counselor from a, from a school wrote that oftentimes we associate love um, we associate love with an emotional feeling. It's just like, oh, he loves me. Like the butterflies in his stomach, right? It's kind of like what Austin had for Noah when he first met her. No, he, he still does. He still does. He still does. He still does. I'm joking. I'm joking. Um, but um, but it, 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 there is an aspect to love where it is like butterflies. You know, it is an excitement, right? Many other writers I was reading into said love is like an excitement. Like, oh, wow. I, I can't wait till we listen to this. But it, it, is that actually love? Is it? I, I, I would say no. I would say you're excited to listen to it. You really admire it. You like it. There are better words to use than saying you love it. And so the, the, that writer in Psychology Today and in another article 
um, advocated for the destruction of the word love in from the English vernacular, simply because it's lost so much meaning. And he was specifically speaking in terms of relationships, right? Boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, that it often, that word itself is often one of the primary issues of communication. Because nobody has a common definition. And even when they do, they have no idea how to use it. Another, Rabbi Webb, he said, I am convinced of the partiality of the definition. He's speaking in the context of the emotional love, right? The emotional, like, oh, I just, butterflies, oh, I just can't wait to see you. He's like, ah, I'm convinced of the partiality. Love, however, should not be seen as a feeling, but as an enacted emotion. And he was speaking in the context of chesed itself. A, 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 a rabbi, he was just like, man, my, our modern culture is kind of getting it wrong. We're, we're missing out. So I bring this up just to show that we're not getting it right. And oftentimes I don't get it right. But I don't get it right. And then I decided to decide, I decided to take a lovely trip down uh, Urban Dictionary, right? And you'll be surprised. So love is giving yourself completely to another without hesitation, without question, without regret, and without second thought. But with indescribable caring, passion, undertaking, and selflessness. Ah, that's not too bad. Um, um, a feeling love can be felt to a person, animal or deity, right? Well, okay. It's a feeling. Uh, and this is my definition of love. Every time you see and talk to this person, you get butterflies in your stomach. You start to feel a bundle of emotion, um, and you would do anything for them. All this huge emotional thing. I'm here to tell you guys that the loving kindness mentioned, the chesed, is so much deeper and it will change the way you look at that word in English throughout scripture. Let's get into it. Chesed. Oh, it's, um, it's not there. Um, all right. Um, so what was there, what was there is that Chesed, it was like a little mountain image. I thought it would be kind of cool. And it said it was a pinnacle of, of Yahweh's name in Exodus 34, 67. So when you read it, if you guys want to reread it, I, I'll just state it. It goes, Yahweh, Yahweh, God, compassionate and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, steadfast love to the thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, who will by no means clear the guilty. But at the center of it, steadfast love is stated twice, which... For Hebrew vernacular, it means like this is, this is important. This is it. This is the crux. This is his name, his character, his calling, right? This is what we talked about in names last week. His name, his character, his calling, the way he moves, the way he acts, the way he thinks. This is the pinnacle of it. So it's important that we understand what it means. And then right by it, I said the amount of times used in the Old Testament, 242. It is important. And then you can even say that um, due to the, to the Greek and everything, you could even say there are some authors, some, uh, this theology is always contested, but some authors would say that chesed informs us of our even Greek reading of love. Because you got to remember, the Gospels were written by, um, three of the Gospels were written by Jewish men. And it's important to know that they probably had a deep understanding of chesed even when it was written in Greek, translated from Greek, um, the whole nine yards. So, what is chesed? Chesed, um, see, it's cool. It's a chet, so chet, you get to, you get to have fun with it, have fun with the word. Um, chesed has uh, three different primary definitions. Nice, right? It's such a complex word. A lot of, a lot of, people who are interested in vernacular say it's just super complex. It is not, it is so deep and beautiful rooted in scripture and Jewish tradition that it is super hard to just accurately translate it. It's super hard. So it means different things concerning the context. Sometimes it could just honestly just mean mercy, the chesed of Yahweh. And you read the concept, the, the verb subject object and you're like, oh, he's being merciful. But more often than not, he either means steadfast love, loving kindness, or covenant loyalty. More often than not, that is typically it. 
those three. And, uh, and oftentimes you'll see many translations that switch it. Um, the Bible Project has a whole video on this. I wish we had Wi-Fi up here because I would just rather show you guys that, um, to be honest. Um, they said that probably one of the more accurate definitions is loyal love. So in between this and that, loyal love. Now, what is this loyal love? Or I, I did steadfast love throughout the slides, but I'll be referring to it as either loyal love or steadfast love. Um, what is it? And why is it important to us? Why, why was this so important? And how is this loyal love markably different than the love we experience or talk about in our daily lives? Chesed. Okay. Uh, is there any way we could uh, like put it like uh, like zoom out or so I could? Okay. No. Yeah, the little the little arrow thing right there. Oh, there it is. Okay, that that works. That works. That's okay. Um, so there's three points I want to make about Chesed. First, it is active. It is never static. It is never static. In reading commentaries and sermons and just reading through scripture. I mean, even reading through Psalms 136, how active was Yahweh? He's creator. He's provider. He's remover of your enemies. He is active. So often we look at love as an emotion. Yahweh looks at it and he's like, it's active. This is where the narrative context comes into play. When he says... He is chesed, and that is his character. When Moses is hearing it, he's like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and when David is writing about it, he's like, yeah, yeah, your, your loving kindness because you split the seas. Your, 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 lo- your loving kindness because you, you, you defeated Egypt. Your, your, your loving kindness because you made a way in the wilderness. It's a dynamic love between Yahweh and his people. Isaiah 63, uh, 63, 9, which was put on my heart over the weekend, and it has just been super impactful, and I've already said it to some of you. Um, spoiler, sorry about that, um, but Isaiah 63, 9 is loaded, um, just absolutely loaded. Let me see here. I don't know why it's not popping up. 63, 9, and he said... And this is Yahweh speaking to Isaiah about Israel. He said, In all their distress, he was distressed. Yahweh was. And the angel of his presence saved him. In his love and his mercy, he redeemed him. In his chesed and his mercy, he redeemed them. And he lifted them and carried them all the ancient days. It's active. Exodus 15, 13. I'll read that for you guys. Some of these I won't read, and it's just up to you to... Take it down as a reference. In your chesed, your loving kindness, you have guided the people whom you have redeemed. In your strength, you have led them to your holy habitation. He's active. He's active. He's moving. He's doing. He's so active that he enacts covenants, right? So loyal love, covenants, that's our next couple slides. But he enacts covenants from Eden to Jesus. There are eight covenants throughout scripture. Six of them are unconditional, where it's no matter what we do, God is just going to do it. Two of them are conditional, and even in those conditional covenants, like the Mosaic one, Yahweh, based off of his chesed, his loving kindness, always saves his people. You can read all throughout the book of Judges, read through the book of Nehemiah. Even Micah chapter 7 speaks about this. So part of those covenants and his activity, now we'll be getting this into his loyal love in a second, but he forgives quickly. His, just like right after he is abounding in steadfast love, steadfast love to the thousands, his said, has said to the thousands, he says he forgives iniquity. His forgiveness is an outpouring of his love for you, brothers and sisters. It is, it's magical. And then, because of that, he is always active. He's always upholding promises. That's why I have the tomb being empty. He just doesn't give a promise that a Savior is going to come and die for us and he will raise him three days after the dead. He does it. And so I have it 
that the grave is empty, his steadfast love is not. It is not empty without action. It is always doing. So, first, it is active. Second, it is loyal. Um, as you can tell there by Google Slides, it's okay. Um, it is loyal. Now, covenant. I mentioned it to you before. This will be a whole study by itself. But in, in essence, the covenants that he makes is a legal agreement. A, or you can say a bond promise between at least two parties. Two people, two parties. It's massive. Uh, covenant in the Old Testament carries heavy weight. If somebody does not uphold the covenant, uh, sometimes it can mean the loss of their life completely. Like, you didn't uphold your promise? How, how dare you, right? So it's not like, oh, I'll keep the promise. And then it's light, even as we have it today in our modern society. A covenant is heavy. It's rooted in deep action. And it's meant to bind loyalty. So the love that sustains covenants, the love that not only enacts it, sustains it with its people. So Exodus 34.10, and I do want to read this to you guys. We're going back, back to where his name was given to Moses. So after Moses hears the name, compassionate, merciful, stead, uh, chesed, you know, chesed to the thousands, he says, then, then Yahweh says, Behold, I'm going to cut a covenant before all your people. I will do wondrous deeds which have not been created in all the earth, nor any of the nations, and all people from whom you will live seeking uh, see the working of Yahweh. For it is a fearful thing that I'm going to do with you. All right? The Mosaic covenant is re-given, re-established. Now we know it has been followed. The Davidic covenant, I could have put the Davidic covenant from 1 Chronicles 17, where that was, I, I feel like I wish I did, but 1 Chronicles 17, um, you know, David gets this word from the prophet, and it's about the coming king from his line, and that king will reign forever. Jeremiah 31, also another promise of, uh, the, the promise of the Messianic covenant. Um, but is he loyal to them? Uh, yeah, he is. Our covenant is relational. He is loyal. The new blood covenant in Christ sustains all the other covenants. He came through with his promise. His loyalty, he was loyal unto the end. He was loyal unto the end. Yeshua, God-man, Jesus himself, came down clothed in flesh, fully man fully God, to fulfill the covenant, loyal. Loyal to the end where he was in the garden of Gethsemane, sweat, blood sweat pouring down from his face, anxiety, stress, betrayal on the horizon, death, a cat of nine tails, and the pains of our sins on his shoulders. Loyal. Because he chesed us, he loves us. And it's important to note that it is covenantal. It's not that he chesed to every. He wasn't telling Moses, I am chesed to the Moabites or to the Hittites. He was speaking in a reference to his covenant people, the Israelites. And what do we have from that loyalty? We have from that loyalty forgiveness of sins. He will always be loyal to forgive you. He is not going to go back on that promise. He is unfailing. It is not going to break. We can lament with him. I spoke to you guys about lament two weeks ago. But you can pour out your heart just like Jesus did to his father. Because he's loyal to hear you. He is gentle and lowly. He is, he, he, he is willing to save. We have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. Talk about the presence of Yahweh dwelling in us. Many temples wherever we go. He is loyal. Right? Think about Romans 8, 31. Rowan spoke about it about, uh, I want to say, three or four weeks ago now. And he spoke about how God's, God's love, like who can separate us from the love of God? Nothing. No one. No, not, why? Not only because it's not static, but because he's loyal. He simply just won't allow it. He's faithful. When he, even when we're not, even when we're like, you know, serving two masters, right? We're serving God of money, less than money. You know, I like to think of his, 
uh, his steadfast love in a way, and his loyalty in a way like a dog and a cat, right? Uh, our steadfastness, our loyalty is much like a cat's. You know, we're kind of there when we need it. You know, like, ah, oh, we need, we want to, we want to get a little treat. We want to be, we want to be brushed and groomed. And when we're not, we're just going to go away and do our own thing. But a dog's loyalty is intense, right? Think about Hachi's tail. The dog waited for its master for like, for years because it was loyal. And I'm not saying uh, Yahweh is a dog by any means. By any means. Don't, don't take that. I just want to give you guys a level of understanding how loyal he is. Um, uh, we, we love because he first loves us. It, his loyalty uh, gives us the ability to love and the ability to rest. Oh, okay, Bob, well, thank you. Yeah. Um, his love is partnered with his slowness. So now we're still in the covenant part, but right before his, him being, fa- uh, you know, abounding in hesed and faithfulness, he is slow to anger. All right. So many often times we think that we can push away his chesed, his love, due to our actions or due to our sins or to our pains. Um, the whole book of Jonah talks about this when it comes to Yahweh's anger and how slow he is a fit and how his loving kindness, his loyalty is just like, boom, compared to his wrath. Like I said last week, his, his mercy runs, his wrath walks. But the whole reason why is because he's loyal and he's loving. Yahweh is not rushed. I, there, there's a whole thing about his slow to anger and how he speaks to Moses on the mountain and how he draws him out into the wilderness. So many times, even in Exodus uh, 3.12 and how Moses was alone and silent and not in a rush and Moses himself was able to, to look at the burning bush. He had the time to do it. That is so important. Yahweh is not rushed. We should not be either. Especially when it comes to his chesed. Uh, 2 Peter 3.9 is just a reference that in his timing, it's good. But his timing is, it's a lot faster than we think. It comes all of a sudden. But when we're first unhurrying our lives and stopping us being busy, right? His said, his loyalty, is patient. It is kind. It is slow with us and our sins. Um, and you're like, all right, Mark. So I guess God is this like unemotional or cold. And he's just kind of like, he loves me just because of his own loyalty and because he's active because he has to be. No, chesed is deeply emotional and passionate too. It is intimate. Mo- he called Moses his friend and he's talking to his friend right there. Moses' face glowed. With the chesed of the Lord. That's what scripture tells us. He had to hide his face with a veil. Because the people could not stand it. He was in the presence of Yahweh all the time. We can be with the presence of Yahweh right now. We can practice his presence. It is intimate. It is oh, it is not cold, my friends. Chesed is a lovely, complex, intimate, dynamic feeling and action towards us. That's what Rabbi Webb was trying to get us to understand. Emotions are partiality. And emotions unhinged, emotions unordered, lead to destruction. That is where you get all the complex issues of, well, she doesn't love me, or he said he cared. But it's so much deeper. There's action. There's loyalty. It's a holy union. In, in Exodus 34... He, he goes on to tell Moses of the covenant he's making, that he's going to be loyal to, that he's already shown he will act on. The, wording, the rewording of the covenant in Exodus 34 is written as if a husband is talking to his wife. He, he, he has said, I don't want you to um, allow your sons to marry foreign women because then they will commit adultery with other gods. Whoa, adultery? Marriage term. Um, and then he says, I want you to keep a feast of unleavened bread so that you can remember when I stole you away from Egypt. 
Oh, stealing away. That's that's intimate. Hosea. I'll read this. Hosea. And we'll be we'll be closing here in a second. Hosea is a perfect. If you if you want to know about the, the about how God's love isn't just active and loyal, you want to know actually how active and loyal it is by how intimate he wishes to be daily with you, ever present with you. Hosea is a book to meditate on and allow to speak into your soul. So background of Hosea really quickly. Hosea was a minor prophet. God called him out and said, you got it. Let's talk about the Israelites and their sins and how they're chasing after other gods. And it's like, all right, I could do that. And God's like, oh, uh, to do so, you got to take a prostitute as your wife. And she will cheat on you like the Israelites do with me. And you will have to continually to buy her back like I do with the Israelites. Uh, sometimes when people are like, oh, I want to uh, have prophetic vision and I want to be a prophet. I'm like, you got to read all the prophets. Uh, you may not want it. Um, so in Hosea chapter 2, he's speaking to Hosea specifically about Israel and what he will do. So Hosea 2.19, we're going to hit back. And I will betroth you to me forever. Indeed, I will bring you back to me in righteousness and in justice, in chesed and in compassion. Right? He's going to do that. How will he do that? How will he do that? Got to go back. Got to go back just a little bit to 2.14 and 2.15. Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak to her heart. Then I will give her vineyards from there in the valley of Achor as a door of hope. And she will sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the day when she came out from the land of Egypt. And I'll just say 16, and it will be in that day, declares Yahweh, that you will call me Ishi, which means husband, and you will no longer call me Baali, which means master. Wow. Just sit with that for a second. He will actively allure you when you feel despondent or you know what love is tenderly, no matter your sins, no matter what it is, because he is bound to you by covenant in his blood. And he will speak tenderly to you. It is amazing. Jer- and then Jeremiah 31.3 is up there, but I really want to get to Zephaniah 3.17 and end on that. I'm like, I just don't get it yet. All right, um, here, another minor prophet where Yahweh is speaking to him, again, about Israel. I, I want you to know the context again. Exodus 34 um, and Hosea is written in the context of great rebellion and sin. Um, Rebellion and sin were Yahweh, I mean, in Hosea, the Mosaic covenant was there and that was a conditional covenant. And yet still Yahweh was so loyal, even during a conditional, uh, uh, conditional covenant, that he made a way to redeem his people. Um, I mean, the Davidic covenant was already in line there too, but you got to remember when Jesus is talking about, um, you know, the old covenant to this one, he's referencing the Mosaic covenant and even a Davidic covenant, like that was an unconditional covenant, but Yahweh's like, I'm going to be loyal. I'm going to be active. How active are you in his intimate love with us? Zephaniah 3, 17. Yahweh, your God, is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. Action, right? He will be joyful over you of gladness. He will be quiet in his love. Another translation would say he would rest you in his love. Rest, right? He is loyal. He will rejoice over you with joyful singing. We oftentimes... When we oftentimes are like this guy, um, just called out into the wilderness, walking aimless. But we're not aimless in his eyes, in his mind. And I want you guys to know that chesed, this love, I really want to, it is active, it is loyal, but it is intimate. And tonight as we go off today, 
resting, trying to practice the presence, trying to get into silence and solitude, learning how to pray, to fast, to worship with our whole rhythm of lives. Just know as we try to worship him and seek after his love and do it, he sings over you. Even after a time of great rebellion. And Luke 15, Luke 15, think about the Father, right? Yahweh. He runs to you to meet you. And just like the brother, if you're already there, you already had all of his chesed and loyalty to begin with. Rejoice in it. Whether you feel like the younger brother or the older brother, that chesed is offered to you guys as covenant people.